Welcome to Nevada and to the 2021 Art and Environment Season. The Nevada Museum of Art has organized five exhibitions to serve as the backdrop for land art, past, present, futures. John Franco Gorgoni, Land Art Photographs, features 50 of this Italian photographer's most iconic images of earthworks in the American West. From Michael Heiser and Walter Di Maria to Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson, Gorgoni was on the ground in the late 1960s to help bring these projects to life. For nearly two decades, the Nevada Museum of Art has considered what is next for land art. We've collected archives and artworks for our permanent collection that look deeply at iconic earthworks. We've asked, who are the voices that have been left out of this dialogue? And what artists are critiquing the genre's most iconic artworks? We've worked with and commissioned artists who see land as part of a larger system. And we've acknowledged those who have known this and fought for this all along. Judy Chicago began making work in response to land art in the late 1960s. Her dry ice fireworks and atmospheres performances offered an alternative ephemeral engagement with the land. The Nevada Museum of Art recently acquired this archive and is debuting it for the first time. The desert has always attracted mischief makers. Those artists and dreamers who see and think differently, who aim to experiment in hopes of changing the world. High Desert Test Sites in Joshua Tree, California has offered artists this creative testing ground for over two decades. Rose B. Simpson's monumental earthen figures ascend from the gallery floor in her exhibition, The Four. Commissioned and recently acquired by the Nevada Museum of Art, their overwhelming presence reminds us all that land art and the land itself is more than just the earth beneath our feet. Hello and welcome to the second presentation of our 2021 Art and Environment season. My name is Anne Wolf and I am the Andrea and John C. Dean Family Chief Curator and Associate Director here at the Nevada Museum of Art. It's great to welcome all of you uh, to this great presentation today. Uh, before I do that, I'll be uh, shortly joined by Bill Fox, the Peter E. Poole Director of our Center for Art and Environment to help welcome our panelists. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please know that the chat today is very active. Um, I know that our speakers hope to engage all of you in a conversation and a dialogue. So feel free to chat and ask questions uh, and to respond and engage in a dialogue in that way. And also, um, if you are interested in closed captioning, it is available. You just need to turn that on uh, by hitting the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So before we begin, and as we continue with our season of land art, I'd like to acknowledge that the Nevada Museum of Art is located in the Great Basin on the occupied territories of indigenous people. The state of Nevada consists of 27 federally recognized tribes from four nations. The Numu, Northern Paiute, the Nui, Western Shoshone, the Washeshu, Washo, and the Nuwu, Southern Paiute. We acknowledge that more can be done to further research and integrate the stories of indigenous people and cultures into the story and history and future of land art and, and into our co collective knowledge of the lands of this place. We're very fortunate to call many artists and leaders in the Numu, Nuwe, Washeshu, and Numu communities our friends and collaborators, and we welcome all of them who are with us and joining us today. So as I mentioned, Bill Fox will join me shortly to uh, begin the conversation. But um, I just wanted to note that we're very fortunate here at the Nevada Museum of Art to be in close proximity to many of the sites uh, where Robert Smithson and Nancy Holt made their work. Obviously, Spiral Jetty is a close neighbor to us in nearby Utah, but some of Holt's and Smithson's lesser known works like Nancy Holt's Western Graveyard series made in Virginia City, Nevada, as well as all of the Mono Lake work were made quite literally in our backyard. Obviously, our Carol Frank Buck Altered Landscape Photography Collection is home to numerous photographs uh, depicting Robert Smithson's work, many of them by the photographer Gianfranco Gorgoni, as well as others. 
but we're also really proud to announce uh, that earlier this year, we recently acquired uh, three artworks by Nancy Holt for our permanent collection uh, that are also on view in the current exhibition, Land Art Expanding the Atlas. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our two panelists today. Go ahead and queue up your screens, Lisa and Kelly, while I introduce you. Lisa Lefebvre is a curator, writer, and editor. She's also the inaugural executive director of the Holt Smithson Foundation, the artist endowed foundation dedicated to the legacies of Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson. Lisa is committed to communicating and testing ideas. She's curated exhibitions in museums across Europe, published writings in international publications, spoken in museums and universities across the world, sat on numerous award panels, and played a pivotal role in shaping academic and arts organizations. Previously, she led the Henry Moore Institute, was an academic in curatorial studies at Goldsmiths University of London, led the contemporary art program at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, and was course director of the arts policy and management program at Birkbeck College at the University of London. Joining Lisa today will be Kelly Kivland. Kelly is the Chief Curator and Director of Exhibitions at the Wexner Center for the Arts at Ohio State University. Previously, she was the curator for 10 years at DIA Art Foundation in New York. At DIA, she realized exhibitions and projects with and about, or, art, with and about artists, including Joan Jonas, Marin Hassinger, Basso Abbas, and Ruan Abu Rame, Carl Craig, and Nancy Holt. In her role at DIA, she also oversaw the stewardship of Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty and Nancy Holt's Sun Tunnels, and curated the Artists on Artists lecture series as well as the Artist Web Projects series. She holds a master's degree from the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. So now if Bill Fox could join us, I will go ahead and pass it to him to begin the conversation. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Lisa and Kelly. Very much looking forward to your talk today. Well, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you again. I'm delighted uh, to welcome colleagues um, from everywhere from Norway to Australia, literally, and to see so many uh, participants popping up uh, to join us this afternoon. I, you know, I just want to say um, it's a beautiful day outside here. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. And, it, you know, after months of smoke from enormous wildfires, there's a blue sky out the window, and I can see individual trees on the mountain ridge miles away. So it's a it's a pleasure to have you all here, at least metaphorically, uh, in, a good, in a good climate. Look, I'm really pleased, Lisa and Kelly, to have two such distinguished colleagues uh, to join us today. Um, Miwan Kwan and Philip Kaiser set up a wonderful situation last week in our first session when they talked about the show that they, they curated at LA MOCA uh, 10 years ago at the Museum of Contemporary Art there, um, you know, Ends of the Earth, land art to 1974. And I say they set this up because that subtitle is a cliffhanger. Uh, you know, it says to 1974. Well, that was a long time ago. That's we're getting on almost 50 years. What happened since? And I asked them, you know, do you, do you two want to tackle that at all? And they said, oh, no, we just want to talk about what we did. We think it's the role of all of the other people coming after us in the, in the different sessions to really answer that question. And today is a unique opportunity for two people who have uh, been stewarding the legacies of some of those earlier artists and seeing how those legacies are playing out now in, in, our, in our society in a very different place 50 years later. And that's in turn going to set up the next conversations that will come for the entire rest of the season. So please, uh, Lisa, I understand you want to start and I'm going to mute and disappear until it's time to deal with questions. Great, so thank you, Anne, and thank you, Bill, for such a warm welcome to us. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here and an immense pleasure too, to be thinking with Kelly and with you. So Kelly is a thinker whose thoughts have consistently expanded the questions that I want to raise about this thing called land art. And that's really the structure for our presentation today. So Kelly and I have prepared a very extensive image presentation, and we want this to operate as a backdrop to a series of 
ruminations on a set of questions that we feel are fundamental to considering. And again, I'm going to use this clunky phrase, um, this thing called land art. And, and we really want to pick up on what Bill introduced. What does it mean to look at land art in the present? Um, now, there is so much to say. And these are just really the top of the mountain of questions that Kelly and I want to address. Um, and we're going to briefly introduce a few ideas about, um, I guess, our, our roles in thinking about creative legacies. Um, and our focus is going to spiral out of Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson. So two artists who both Kelly and I are intensely committed to and to thinking through. And from Anne's very generous introduction, you know that we both have particular roles that are involved in this. I have the great privilege of being uh, the director of a very young organization, Holt Smithson Foundation. And our pro approach at the foundation is really to address the creative legacies of these two artists, Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson, who built the ground of so many urgent ideas for today. So we understand creative legacies as really being about researching, about unpacking how the art and ideas by these two artists vibrate with this version of the present, subsequent versions of the present, and versions of the present to come. So as an organization, we are a time-bound organization and we take both artists' generative research as being our guide star. And our aim as an organization is to simultaneously develop a ground from which research can raise questions and also to actively develop resources. So that could be research resources, it could be exhibitions, publications, public programs, and artist commissions. So we are an organization who are interested first and foremost in questions. So throughout our lifetime, which I used to be able to say was 20 years, I now need to say is 18 years, we want to really establish resources and try and think about what are the knots, what, what are the problems around land art, around earthworks, around the language that we use to describe it, and really importantly, in its ethics. So Holt Smithson Foundation is less interested in pickling the artist's work in the past, in trying to fix it in 1974 or 1969. We're much more interested in thinking about how their legacies exist in the present and also offer thoughts for the future. Now, the way that we do this is always in partnership. And partnership is absolutely inherent to everything that we do. So we consider everyone in this conversation, which we hope it will become, a thinking partner. And really one of our um, thinking partners who we talk the most with is the Art Foundation, um, who, um, whose legacy, whose commitment to stewarding this thing called land art um, is really second, second to none. Thank you, Lisa. Such a pleasure to be here this evening with all of you. I'm watching the chat and it's incredible to see where everyone's joining from. And thank you to Anne and to Bill, Claire and Christian. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, Sun Tunnels as well as Spiral Jetty and uh, Dia Art Foundation as the owner and steward of both of these works. As Lisa mentioned, it really um, these these works are stewarded now and have been for the last 10 years or now 11 years um, through what are very comprehensive and intentful collaborations with organizations based in Utah where both of these works are located. Um, for Nancy Holt, the partners include uh, Center for Land Use Interpretation, 
of course, the Holtzmissen Foundation, as well as the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. And I shouldn't forget our um, tremendous partners, or sorry, Dia's tremendous partners um, at uh, the state, which is the Fire, Forestry, and State Lands Division, who oversee um, a lot of the, the area of the county of Box Elder County for us. Um, and they help in the further, uh, the advocacy for sun tunnels. Um, likewise, for Spiral Jetty, there is um, a contingency of um, partners as well. And they are um, the Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College, the Holtzmissen Foundation, the Utah Museum of Fine Arts again, who all together um, over the last, uh, say 10, 11 years, these partners came together um, really due to um, some unfortunate occurrences that it had um, unfolded uh, in terms of the, how the lease of a spiral jetty was being administered. And through that um, situation, let's say, it was actually a really fantastic and positive uh, way forward where Dia was asked to um, form local partnerships and be on the ground. Um, and through that um, came a collective steward um, collaboration and, and model that has been continued forward. Uh, through that have been lots of conversations around um, not only the environment of which both sun tunnels and spiral jetties sit, but the local communities, the history, the social and political histories of those sites and um, how in, into the future those sites can act and be an agent, a protagonist for uh, various conversations that complicate the legacies of land art. So next we are going to um, watch um, just bringing forth the mission of the Art Foundation, this is from the 74 Charter, uh, when the foundation was founded, that very much informs much of the work today in realizing these site-specific installations. Also, Dia's collecting of this focus group of artists from the 60s and 70s, but it's also a mission that's really been a guiding force for Dia ever since. Um, and the projects that um, we are talking about today in terms of Smith and Spiral Jetty, as well as Holt Sun Tunnels, um, are really grounded in this original mission, which just to pull out a couple of the excerpts here, it's looking at and determining the nature of the environment of the works and the manner in which the works are visited, um, as well as the commitment to realizing the collaboration of the artists with the Dia Art Foundation and really thinking about the stages and, and how it's realized um, was very much a part of this original mission. Now, Sun, Sun Tunnels came to Dia just a few years ago um, through the assistance of the Holt Smithson Foundation. Um, and then in 1999, Spiral Jetty was um, gifted to Dia Art Foundation from Nancy Holt, as well as um, through the um, generosity of the Robert Smithson uh, estate at that time. I think now, if I'm if I'm stable, am I stable now? It feels very okay. Great, great. Um, so now we're going to watch two short moving image works that have not never been seen. Um, they have, are coming forth from the foundation. And Lisa, maybe if you want to jump in and just say a little bit, um, because you know these works so much better than I. Yeah. So Kelly and I really wanted to show you all something very special partly because this conference is so key to thinking through land art in such a long-term and sustained way. So we're going to show two clips. The first one is just about two and a half minutes or so, and it shows Robert Smithson's spiral jetty being constructed in 1970. And I find this a really amusing um, short film because there's something really geeky and, and goofy about young artists making a work and a work that we now see as being, and I feel that I'm shuddering slightly when I use this adjective, so canonical. And then we'll turn to um, a, a slightly longer clip, about four minutes of Nancy Holtz Missoula Ranch Locators. Both are silent. We will switch ourselves to mute during the first one. And then when we begin the second one, it's a little bit longer and a bit slow at the start. So I'll just do a quick introduction then.
So just um, to let you know what we're looking at here, because of course Spiral Jetty is a work that we're all pretty familiar with. This is a work by Nancy Holt that we're less familiar with. It's from 1972 and it's called Missoula Ranch Locators. Um, and what you're seeing here is um, a film by Nancy Holt. And the previous clip we showed was also filmed, we believe, by Nancy Holt. Um, and this is the moment when this work was just completed. Um, and Nancy Holt here was taking um, a body of work that she called her locators. So these, you know, monocular viewing devices out into the landscape. And she often in her writing said that this work was really fundamental to the thinking around sun tunnels. Um, and I think what you see here is something that we often find with the way that Nancy Holt um, used film and used photography, a set of ideal views of the work. And we can maybe talk about that a little bit, bit later. Um, but we wanted to highlight this really to echo the um, values of this whole conference and the collection in, in Reno, which is to look at the places where land art is not necessarily written about. So we'll leave this just run briefly and then we'll return to our conversation. So we, Kelly and I thought that we would now return to these key questions, just almost as a, a kind of a prompt or provocation to look at the difficult questions uh, around land art. And what we thought we would do um, while we were talking, we're going to present something that, um, again, is, is very, very special. The following images, as we say in the slide here, were pulled together by Nancy Holt when she talked herself about her work and that is of Robert Smithson. And we're going to really use this as a, a backdrop as we're talking, um, rather than speaking to any particular images. Having said that though, um, we can predict that there's many things to talk about in these images. So do pop a message in the, the chat. And I feel I should also give a bit of a, a caveat from Holt Smithson Foundation's perspective. We might not be able to answer your questions. So again, this is really part of how we see ourselves is trying to gather particular questions to really expand the, the scholarship. Um, and this is where I want to start. So um, for me, from that list of questions, the ones that I want to start the conversation with is thinking a little bit about a term that I'm spending a lot of time bothering 
about, which is the idea of situated knowledge. So perhaps if we were to summarize where we're thinking about artistic practice now, I'd like to propose that maybe one way we could phrase it is by situating the knowledge. So what does this mean? So situated knowledge is really a moment when we ground knowledge in the assumptions, the conventions, the justice, the injustice of any particular time. So if we apply this to art, and if we apply this to land art, we really need to think about art as being situated in its own time. And then we need to think about how art is not just situated in the time of its making, it's also about how it travels through to the present, through to the future. So one of the things that I'd really like to hear your thoughts on, on Kelly is about this notion of time when it comes to land art. And as someone who's been so closely involved in the stewardship of land art, this is both a poetic and intellectual and a pragmatic question. So to think about sun tunnels, for example, Sun Tunnels is many things. It's an earthwork that's on the Great Salt Lake. It's a film. It's an essay. It's a series of drawings. It's a journey. It's a rumor. And picking up from what Mi Wong Kwan and Philip Kaiser talked about last week, it's also a mediated artwork. So it travels through photography. Now, the moment we start to think about a mediated artwork, it becomes very interesting because it means that artwork is not fixed. It's changing over time. And so I want to come back um, to this idea, to this term, land art. If we think about the land, we must think about its ownership, its values, how it's been occupied, how it's been settled, how it's been controlled, who has access to it, what grows in it, what doesn't grow on it, um, what are the ecological implications. So as you might have guessed, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this term land art. Um, and I think quite often with land art about the introduction that Lucy Lippard makes in her book, six years, the dematerialization of the art object. And she wrestles with conceptual art being big C or little c. So big C is a naming, whereas a little c is an adjective. And I kind of wonder with land art, what is our preference? Um, and I have to admit that until last week, I always lent to earthworks. But Miwon and Philip opened up a new set of ideas for me. Um, last week, they were very vehement that land art is the right term. Why? Because they felt that land art was integral to the political engagement with the land's uses, histories, um, the politics of the land. Perhaps that's why land art is preferable to earthworks. So to start our conversation, these are some of the things that are bothering me most of all, and I'd like to turn to Kelly, and then we'll also make sure that we um, refer to any questions that are in the chat function too. I think it's a great place to, to start, Lisa. Um, there's a lot of questions you had within that. I, I want to go maybe first to this idea of the situated understanding of art and how it can inform and impact um, our understanding of land art today. I think I share your opinion of wanting it to be a, a little L and a little A. Um, it certainly feels more appropriate um, in terms of our use and thinking around land art um, in, the current, in the current landscape. Um, I also think that the discussion of land art is important for many reasons. Um, it is, you know, why does it matter today was one of your questions. And I, this is one that I was really grappling with myself. And I really think it's for a couple of reasons, namely 
the um, the notion and and why land art matters today. I'm sure it'll be taken up by many over the course of this fall during the, um, the continuation of this series. It really should be about redirecting us to consider the history of these pieces, um, also of indigenous art in our landscape from the petroglyphs, for instance, in Utah to, to the Great Serpent Mound, for instance, in Ohio near where I live now. Um, and second, it really concerns the duality in which humans shape and inhabit the world as both a presence and also a document in its greater environment, their greater environment, and how land art functions within that, especially as it relates to um, this understanding, for instance, a situated understanding of how we can view and, and think about land art today. Um, what I really appreciate around um, sort of the complicated nature of land art, and especially as it's really evolved in scholarship over the last five to 10 years, and especially when I was sort of thinking about this um, in, as an active um, party in, in the stewardship of these works is um, the ethics centered around thinking through its place, their position in the environment, and also how they can act as agents and, and um, as I mentioned earlier, protagonists for uh, concerns around those sites. So not just environmental, but also thinking through those social and political histories and as well as the geologic. I think one of the things that um, the, the Nancy Holt Symposium that Dia held many years ago is we had a geologist. And I, find, I found him to be one of the most fascinating lecturers because it really traced a much longer understanding of our environment, of our history, as we all know. But to really trace that, particular to the Great Basin, is important specifically to the work of, of Nancy and, and Bob uh, as it pertains to that northwest corner of, of Utah. Um, so I'm not so much answering, I'm opening up maybe more questions, but um, the ethics around you know, issues of climate change, the extraction economy, the displacement and dispossession, gentrification, immigration and migration, all of these things I, are central to complicating our relationship to land art today. And so there's real value there. There is an ethics around speaking to it. And what time provides us, going back to your very first question, is a renewed perspective uh, with renewed scholarship, with renewed understanding. And each and every moment or, or year that passes, we become more informed um, around what it really meant to inhabit the land, the problematics around land use, um, who was invited, and, and who could get there also. Um, so these are a lot of um, the questions I've been wrestling with in relationship to preparing for the tonight. And maybe I'll turn it back to you. Um, in terms of the work that is, is being done at the Holtzmissen Foundation, I'm really curious as to how the programs and, and for instance, the fellowships that you've been shaping invite some of these, um, I guess, more questions as you pose them, but further thinking around these works, both past, present, and even into the future. It's, it's a really nice question, and it maybe comes back to this sense of trying not to pickle in vinegar the, the work from when it, it was made, and really to, um, to think about Halton Smithson's work as being on this arc of possibilities of shifting and, and changing. So um, there's one question in, in the chat um, that I think is, is really important to note. So Emily Eliza Scott um, notes that with the Missoula Ranch Locators film, that it's really interesting to see this quite bucolic green landscape. Um, and both Holt and Smithson were really interested in the rougher landscape. One of the things that um, really fascinates me about that clip is that you see this verdant, beautiful landscape. But when the camera zooms in through the locators, you see vehicles, you see a truck, you see um, farming, which is all this sense of land management. And I, I think that sense of the time becomes really important. And then to come back to a sense of looking at the questions, the problems, and your, your nice question about our, our research fellowships. One of the things that we feel as an organization is our ethical responsibility 
is not to hide from the difficult questions about land art. Um, so one example would be one of the slides Kelly and I showed earlier is of Robert Smithson's asphalt rundown in, in Rome. What does that mean? Would we really be comfortable in 2021 with glue, asphalt, concrete being poured down the earth in a sculptural event? We would probably frown over it. What does it mean with that movement over time? One of the things that um, I keep on thinking about Smithson's work is his incredible prescience. Um, so Smithson at the time of making his work was in disagreement with a lot of the ecological thinking of the time. It wasn't that he was not aware of the scarring of the surface of our planet through industry. It's more that he didn't want to go back into time to try and erase what had happened by um, industry's impact on the landscape. He wanted to look at it. He wanted to point to the change. And in fact, these images here um, are from Smithson's 1969 trip to the Yucatan uh, in Mexico with Nancy Holt and Virginia Dwan. And he made a series of mirror displacements there um, that were temporary earthworks. So I think when it comes to thinking about land art, this temporality is really key. Do land art, or does land art, I should say, or do earthworks change over time? Are they permanent? Are they not permanent? Missoula Ranch locators, Nancy Holt wanted to be permanent, but it was taken down by the landowners. Um, spiral jetty is permanent and it changes over time. Um, and I think with Holt and Smithson, um, sometimes we have cornered ourselves in a little bit when we think about their work, because so often they're framed within this idea of land art. So these images we're looking at now, this is a series of works Nancy Holt made called Miami Puddles. Is this land art? Well, if we use Miwon and Phillips terminology, it is. It's looking at an urban landscape and gathering of water. This work, Trail Markers, by Nancy Holt, made in 1969, a year after the Miami Puddles, is this land art? Well, it's more recognisable as such, yet it's in the form of, of photography. So I think this sense of expanding what land art becomes really Im important. And I think one of the things that we're learning more and more about Nancy Holt is that she was very interested in the long history. She was interested in the petroglyphs. In fact, there's a photographic series she made of the petroglyphs. Her library, which has very recently been inventoried um, by the scholar Hikmet Lowe, reveals that she was interested in looking at indigenous land, the peoples who live on the land. So she was paying attention to that. And then when we think about time, about geological history, in that great essay that Smithson wrote on Frederick Law Olmsted, he starts off by asking us to imagine Central Park in the last ice age. So that sense of um, engagement with the changing times becomes really crucial. And perhaps this is one of the things um, that I really, one of the many things that I really admire about Dia's stewardship, not just of Holton Smithson, but of all of the works that come under this big L, little L, A, land art um, grouping at Dia is the sensitivity to time. And I'd like to ask you, Kelly, a little bit about what you feel, not just from Dia's perspective, but as a curator and an art historian, mm -hmm. about the life of artworks, um, about how an artwork changes because the situation around it changes, but also because the materiality 
changes over time? Hmm. That's a great question. That actually goes along with um, what Mary Dahl and Duckler has um, put in the chat as well, how it differs or intersects with the idea of situated knowledge. Um, it's a really great question, Lisa. I think the, you know, what I think about um, what, who comes to mind is, um, especially in this, in this context is Beverly Buchanan's work, who wasn't as well known um, and is thinking very similarly in some ways to this idea of how an artwork changes in the immediate, quite honestly. I mean, one of the works that um, really stands out for me and I think is, is in conversation and certainly in dialogue with Smith and Sparrow Jetty and his ideas around entropy or entropic uh, works um, as it is realized through Spiral Jetty is Marsh Runes, um, which was a work that she had um, realized in 1981 in Georgia. And it's a, a sculpture that she made in the marshes that essentially is disappears or is run over by um, or is inter, uh, intervened with um, through the natural environment, through the water. And she, document, she documents not only its, its construction, but also how it, um, the waters rise and, and erode it over time. Um, and also within this very structure of it being a land artwork, she is very much pointing to the historical and, and racialized politics of the Southeast, um, thinking about uh, a ruination um, as a form. Um, and this is, I think very much in part of the story of how we frame, for instance, and think about Smithson and Holt uh, alongside someone like Buchanan um, and how the, her approach, for instance, to a work not dissimilar to, say, Spiral Jetty can help a new reading or um, a counter reading to what Smithson was doing. And I think through that, you know, through um, through your very question from the beginning, how and how an artwork can evolve, how it can change, how it can be more, become, how we can complicate or complexify uh, what that artist's intent was. You know, I think part of the the main um, hardship I, I might have had or or have continued to have around being a steward of works by artists that are no longer living is what it means to think about. What is a legacy? What, what, how, do you, how do you do, what is the ethics around representing an artist's intent, uh, especially as it relates to this conversation? And, um, you know, it's protection as an artwork versus it's protection as an artist's intent is something that I think is a constant tension, especially as it relates to um, evolving conversations. I, I, re I really agree in that sense of, artworks having their their own life there's a, a wonderful phrase that I learned from the architectural historian Mark Cousins um, and he talked about the difference between inhibition and exhibition and he was mm -hmm. talking in the context of more museum ba based works and he just used that power of language and said when an artwork is in the public realm it is exhibited so it is exhibition, it sits out there in the world. When the work is in the studio, it is inhibited. So as my mind started to think of the inhibited artwork in the studio as being like a moment as we all do when you feel a bit shy and you're not really communicating with people and the exhibited work as being the louder, um, human being at a gathering who's talking and, and sharing. And one of the things that um, I personally love so much about land art, small l, little a, um, is its generosity. Um, and in particular, Holt and Smithson's generosity. Um, I really love that Nancy Holt um, refused categorizing herself as a conceptual artist, a minimal artist, a land artist for that matter. And she really saw herself as an artist engaged in perception. And maybe this is where there's um, part of the urgency about why land art still matters is that um, my provocation is that I don't think art can change the world, but I think art can change perceptions. And if you can change perceptions, you can then change the world. 
right? And we can think about that in terms of who we see in work, what we see in work, what we see occurring. Um, and even an image like this um, that Nancy Holt took of the con construction or of sun tunnels mm. in Nancy Holt's um, hands, this becomes part of the work of the work, the work of the labor of making land art. So, and I think when we consider the, the politics of making land art, who made the work? How were they involved? And Nancy Holt was very carefully attuned to that. She had a great um, appreciation for the skill of earthworks in the non-art meaning of building roads, um, creating, creating sites. Um, there's a, a question, Kelly, that you raised that I'd like to come back to a little bit, which is the sense of um, land art and, and access. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I've been bothered about for a, a little while, is we often talk generally that land art is something that is open to everyone. Uh, most, not all, um, examples of land art you can access at any time of the day, and particularly with sun tunnels and spiral jetty. It's free, there's no gatekeeper, you can go and see it. But it also has a whole bunch of assum assumptions about sight. So there's two that are in friction with each other. Firstly, often those two artworks are described as being remote. Well, I always want to think remote from what? If you live in Lucin, which is the closest town um, with a tiny, tiny population, um, I could be misremembering this, but I think when Nancy Holt made Sun Tunnels, the population was 15 people. Um, it's not remote from those people but it's remote from, let's say, New York City, where the artist came from. And then the other friction as well is it takes time, and with time comes financial mobility to be able to visit artwork. So I think this really gets to a question that Derek Knight has put within the, the chat, that mm -hmm. um, the mediated nature of these examples of land art that we're looking at and talking about today, I think it's the photography is making the artwork mobile. And in fact, Smithson talked about this in an amazing interview between Smithson, Heiser, Oppenheim and Willoughby Sharp in the very first issue of Avalanche magazine. I think that um, the works are many things at the same time. They're not either or. They're mediated and they're sighted. They are near and they're far. So it's almost that sense of that both and is part of the artwork. They're slippery. They're not definitive. Um, and they have these gloriously blurry edges. Where does the work begin? Where does it end? I personally remember the very first time I went to see Sun Tunnels and Spiral Jetty. For me, it began, the work began through my pre-knowledge of the work um, and then with my journey at that time from London, which felt a very remote distance from these sites. And when I think of the works, I think about their sight, the journey, and the mediation that surrounds them. Hey guys, it's Bill. Uh, it probably is time now, we've got about 10 minutes left or so, uh, just to take a little break here. You're doing a brilliant job of actually answering all of the questions in the chat, which is terrific. So I just wanted to, to bring out a couple of things and then, and then have you uh, look at the, uh, uh, any other questions that are there and have Christian Davies, our director of public program and break in to see if he's received any questions um, as well. Um, it was amazing to see, you know, that, that, that clip of the Smithson and Sarah uh, partnership working on Spiral Jetty and to actually see 
an oil exploration rig still standing at the end of the jetty. Smithson was not out after some, you know, talk about the, the situation of this. He's not out, out after, you know, um, a pristine rural wilderness experience. He really does want to involve and evoke the esteem of industry and the ruination of industry and take full uh, complicity with that. So that was amazing. The Nancy Holt photos also of the Virginia City graveyard sites, um, which is about 25 miles from where I'm sitting this afternoon uh, from Reno. And just to see how she's always interested in exploring boundaries, not just on the ground, but if you will, also in spirit. So that's a very, uh, for me, that's a very poignant series that, that is quite meaningful. Um, and then Kelly, thank you for bringing up the Beverly Buchanan Marsh Ruins um, things, as you have brought up many things during the um, uh, many works that are here on view at the museum. Um, we just acquired uh, some archive materials from one of Beverly's friends, uh, and then they're in the show. And so uh, Ann Wolf did a marvelous job of, of excavating a remarkable circumstance here with her history for us. So just really pleased that you're, you all both are just addressing so many things that are both physically here in the museum and also things we've been thinking about but not articulating uh, to this level. So this is absolutely terrific. With that, um, I'm gonna either turn it back over, maybe Christian, you wanna step in, I'll disappear uh, until the very end and uh, see if we have other responses from our presenters and from the audience. Absolutely, thank you so much, Bill. And thank you again, Lisa and Kelly for a, a tremendous program today. We do have one question that's coming from Rita Norton. And Rita's asking, uh, her, her question is, land art seemed to come on the scene shortly after the landing on the moon. Do you see a connection? My first thought is there's a really um, fantastic book written by James Nesbitt that brings in this complete question with such erudition. So everything I'm now going to say is a pale imitation of what James Nesbitt's book uh, addresses. Um, one of the things that, of course, was so amazing about the moon landing is that we got to see our planet in its completeness. Um, we got to see mediation of where we are. Um, I think that, um, I don't know if there was a direct correlation, but maybe it's a set of circumstances that brings, to f brings forth connections that we hadn't thought about. We could also map, and this is what James Nesbitt done, does in his book, um, that exploration with the um, rising ecological movement as well. And also in terms of, um, and this is something that one of Kelly's former colleagues at DIA has thought a lot about, um, Alexis Lowry, really thinking about the expansion of the motor car and the infrastructure of the road network that enabled people to get out and travel. And I often think a lot about um, something that I know touched my childhood. There used to be a, I want to say a fashion, maybe a tendency is something, a better word, that when you go on vacation, you show your family and friends a slideshow of where you've been. That sense of going elsewhere and bringing it back to the near. I think that's really important in relation to land art because it's not just about the going elsewhere, it's coming back again to Derek's question, it's about bringing the elsewhere back to the near. So I'm thinking about Smithson's interest in the site non site dialectic. I think just to add a bit to that, um, I think it's Doug Dashman that talked about the moon landing in relationship to Nancy's work, correct? Um, but I also wanted to highlight something that really came forth when I was working on the, the whole show uh, for Dia, which was, um, the 1970 um, great eclipse that occurred that became a um, very important and influential to Holt's work so as, as it relates to the locators, but also um, to the work that became these light installations um, that were realized um, in the early to mid 70s. And it's, um, I think, so these natural occurrences, of course, figure quite highly in Nancy's practice from there on. Um, 
but to speak specifically about them during the 60s as they were influencing, not only, as you said, Lisa, this documentation, this idea that we can actually trace and see what is occurring beyond our physical or grounded environment certainly had a, a huge impact on, on Nancy, but also I think in relationship to, um, I wouldn't say shrinking, but making our greater, our greater landscape, our greater environment, something that felt more manageable for all. I think that's a, a tremendous place to go ahead and end and be mindful of everybody's time here today. I'm gonna to go ahead and I'm sorry if we're not able to get to every single question, unless Lisa or Kelly, are you up for one last one that just came in that's, that looks pretty juicy? I'm happy to do one last one. Yeah, we can keep going for hours. That's Emily Eliza Scott, <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a long one. We can do this though. We're, we're not gonna be able to go for hours, but I think we can run a little bit over here. And we've got a great question that came in from uh, Emily Eliza Scott, who's also a presenter during uh, our season. Can you both talk more from your institutional insider positions about the process of governing decision-making around preserving versus uh, all allowing entropy to take its course with regards to individual works? Which constellation of actors determine the outcome of each of the large-scale iconic earthworks? Too big a question, I know, but maybe some antidotes or updates. Mm. I mean, the short answer is that we think about and wrestle with this question an awful lot um, and it's in a very smithson way it's it's a dialectical problem um, so earthworks change over time the surface of the earth changes over time um, and it's very important that that is allowed um, yet do we want the works to disappear? Well, no, we don't. And I think Spiral Jetty is the one that's most often discussed. Um, and we know that Smithson knew the Great Salt Lake would rise and fall. Um, he was completely aware of that. Um, so he knew it would alter. And um, I kind of intuitively feel, and we intu intuitively feel that Holt Smithson Foundation, it's absolutely not about trying to take Spiral Jetty back 50 years to 1970. So it looks as if it's just fresh out the box, as it were. Time has changed it and enriched us. Um, and often I, I, I come back to Smithson's engagement with the landscape and Holt's engagement with the landscape for that matter. Mm -hmm. It changes over time and because it changes that is part of the work they are temporal artworks and because of because they're temporal artworks they will show their age over time and i i, I really love the the living nature of earthworks um, they like us human beings change over time um, every year the way we physically appear is different um, we can't turn back the clock. And that's part of the beauty of being a living being. One of the things with, with Spiral Jetty that um, we talk a lot about is the responsibility of everybody to leave no trace when they go there. So it's also about the visitorship mm -hmm. is a major challenge. And um, also the desire um, to just take a little rock from Spiral Jetty for oneself. But of course, it never is just for oneself. Because if one person does it, two people do it. And if everyone does that, the earthwork will not be here in six months' time, let alone six decades' time. And part of the power of the work is perhaps there's an, an analogy that if we do not think about the surface of our planet now, we're going to be in even bigger trouble than we are already. And I think it's that um, power of the work that's really important. So the answer is about trying to find an impossible balance, yeah. letting the changes happen, but making sure it doesn't disappear. And I think the, this idea of preservation that you were just talking to, to Lisa is complicated. Um, and it's something, as, as you know, we 
uh, or, you know, we have talked about you and I um, for many years, uh, and certainly Dia has been wrestling with for many years as well. Um, but really thinking about the greater context of these works is essential to any preservation for ourselves as well as for the artwork. So really widening the scope of that question is, I think, where we um, really need to be um, more um, mindful of, to be thinking about not just the artworks, but the preservation of their landscape, how they are um, can allow us, rather, the ability to look at the changing climate, the, the effects of, uh, of that climate on these works is certainly telling and, and they do change, um, but it also allows us as visitors to, to be mindful and, and to look for that change, to understand how we are uh, a part of that change um, for the long term. So this sort of just broadening the question of preservation, I think is um, useful for all of us. And maybe if you can just bear one, one more minute, um, Dia did a, a really wonderful assessment of, of sun tunnels and to think about um, what, what the work needed. And one of the things that um, those who've been to sun tunnels will know are there these lines inside the tunnels. These are calls from um, people shooting and the bullet ricocheting through the, the tunnels. This is something that Nancy Holt was very fond of. Um, and so of course it should stay. Um, so that sense of being sympathetic and thinking about the changes is, is just so important. That's great. Well, thank you both so much. I, again, to take a Christian's term, I'm being mindful of our, our audience's time and whatever. It's um, very nice to see me one actually just wrote in talking about uh, Noguchi's sculpture to be seen from Mars uh, that, they, <laughs> that they talked about on the show. So um, there's a lot, a lively conversation here that's going on in the chat. And I wish you were all here. I wish so much, you know, we physically could have been together um, standing on the roof of the museum in this beautiful sunshine uh, and having this conversation go on and on. I could not have envisioned a better second session for this entire season to have such a powerful follow-up and uh, a vivid one with those images uh, to what we started in the first session and what we'll be doing uh, for the rest of it. I'm gonna turn this back over to, to uh, Christian, uh, who's got a, just a little bit of housekeeping to do and uh, Kelly and, you know, um, Lisa, I, can't, I, just, I have to thank you so much for bringing enormous bodies of knowledge into this conversation. So thank you, thank you. And um, yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, by the way, I just, rhetorically, the way you've handled the entire event. I really appreciate your interaction with the audience and everything. That's just been great. Uh, Kristen, uh, back to you and, and everyone. I'll see you guys, uh, not tomorrow, but I'll see you uh, in a week or two. All right. Thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, Lisa, Kelly, thank you again so much for just a really wonderful afternoon. Um, I do, like Bill said, wish that we were up on the roof enjoying a beverage and continuing the conversation. As a reminder for all of our audience, uh, today's program was being recorded and the recording should be available uh, later this evening through the uh, Art Environment Season website. If you click on Schedule, View Session, you'll be able to find the recording right there. Um, we invite you all back for tomorrow's program, Earthworks and the Erasure of History with Karen Shaw and Colleen Smith at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Again, go to our microsite, click on Schedule and then View Session and that's how you'll be able to get in. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me directly. My, my email is all over our microsite as well. Have a wonderful afternoon and thank you again for joining us.